We have a very interesting session today. Uh, all of you must know uh, who our guest speaker is. Uh, for the second session of Meet an IAU Astronomer, we have invited a very special guest. Uh, he's a space science professor and he's a researcher. He was the director of the International Space Science Institute in Switzerland. He was the gold medal Royal Astronomical Society winner in 2014. And he was the president of the Royal Astronomical Society in 2016. And there are many articles, many documentaries, many pages of web pages just describing what this person is. So I would not take more time. Just by saying the name, you might know this person. He's none other than John Zanecki. So uh, we thank him for spending the time and coming for this event. So without further ado, let's move on with the session. It is, Are We Alone? So I'll be sharing my screen, the presentation. And over to you, John. You can uh, signal any time you want to start presenting. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. Well, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry for these technical issues. Um, they're beyond my control. Um, can I first say that it's a great uh, honor for me to be speaking uh, to you in Sri Lanka. I've never had the uh, privilege of visiting Sri Lanka. I hope one day to be able to do that. Uh, this is the closest um, I have come. Um, I'm nervous about speaking to you, but one, because I am, uh, as I said, I've never spoken in Sri Lanka before. Secondly, is a completely different reason. I don't know if any of you are sports fans. I know cricket is very popular in Sri Lanka, but here in Europe at the moment, we have the Euros uh, football competition and in a I think three hours time, we have England versus Scotland, which is a very game and I'm a football. And now for that, let's move to astronomy. So as you see from the title, I'm Emeritus Professor of Space Science. This means I'm now retired. So I've had a long career in space science, but I'm still associate with the university. And you will also see, as was mentioned, that I was until uh, 2018, I was the president of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, if I could have the next slide. Um, I hope this is going to work. I wonder, I see no change, so perhaps we have a long delay. Um, have you moved the slide to the next one? Yes, yes, I have. OK, so I just I'm going to have one slide to just tell you a, a, a little bit about some of the things I have done to uh, which might help the context. So I did my degree. This is uh, one of the oldest colleges of Cambridge University, which is the second oldest university in England. So I studied physics there. And uh, next, uh, please. After my physics degree, I went to London University, University College London, to do a PhD. And that is when I started my career as a rocket scientist, as we say. And this was the 1970s when most of the research in space science was done through, which gave us just, just uh, maybe 10 minutes above the Earth's atmosphere. And I started by being an X-ray astronomer, building X-ray detectors to look for X-rays, which of course are absorbed in the Earth's atmosphere. And um, I got my PhD then, and next, uh, please, I then moved to work on a project, in fact, in industry. And you might recognize the image of the project I next worked on, which I don't see yet, but hopefully you can see it. And it is the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, not many people know that Hubble is actually 20% European. And I worked on the European contribution to Hubble. So hopefully you can see bottom right, that is the Hubble Space Telescope. And as I say, 
20% was provided by Europe. And I worked on the faint object camera, which was the first camera carried by Hubble. Uh, and then next, please, after working on that for three years, I moved to work on a satellite called Giotto. Now, Giotto was, I would suggest, was the first really, really important totally European space science mission. It was launched in 1985 to go to Halley's Comet. And there is the spacecraft with myself in the middle, a younger me, and some of my colleagues. And this flew 600 kilometers from the nucleus of Halley's Comet and produced the first ever close up data on comets. And uh, after that project, uh, next please. This is a schematic showing of the project that I worked on for nearly 20 years. This is Cassini Huygens, which I hope you might have heard of. This was a big collaboration between NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency, with a Cassini spacecraft carrying that small uh, circular object on the left, the Huygens probe. And the target was the Saturnian system and especially the um, moon, that orange object, Titan. Um, and next, please. So I would also just mention that something that has also given me great pride in my career is uh, to have been president of the Royal Astronomical Society, which is the oldest professional astronomy society in the world. This is an old picture uh, of where it is situated in the centre of London. This is from the 1870s. Well, the building is still there, but instead of carriages and uh, pedestrians, we now see buses and motor cars. But this is in uh, Piccadilly, in the very centre of London. OK, so that's a tiny bit about me. Let's now move to the question, which is, are we alone? in the universe, in brackets, of course. And I'm not, I should tell you, an astrobiologist. I'm very much a, a space and rocket scientist and astrophysicist. But this question of looking for life in the universe is a fascinating topic, which is totally multidisciplinary. Um, so on the next slide, then, the question, are we alone? I In this context of this question and the answer, I would very much like the quotation which is attributed to the American physicist Lee Dubridge. And he said the following. Next. There are two possibilities. Either, next. Either we are totally alone in the universe. Next or we are not. Now that's perhaps stating the obvious, but he then went on to say, next, either one is mind boggling. And when I first heard that, I thought, gosh, he's, he's absolutely right. Whichever is the arm, whichever it is, it is just staggering that we are either totally alone or we are not. And let's just probe a little bit those two possibilities. Next slide. So the next slide is, a, is, a, is an artificial image, but I hope that most of you will have seen a beautiful night sky uh, away from the city lights uh, with the Milky Way uh, across the sky. Can we see that in the next slide, please? OK, I'll assume it's there. It's not on my screen. But m many of you will have seen, of course, the beautiful um, night sky with thousands, well, under perfect conditions, thousands of stars from our own uh, Milky Way. There it is, yes, thousands of stars. And of course, 
we know that though we can see under perfect conditions thousands of stars, that our Milky Way galaxy contains perhaps 10 to the power 11 stars. And in fact, in this next slide that you have moved on, this is what is called the Hubble Deep Field. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this image. So this was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. They looked at a tiny anonymous part of the sky. This is really tiny. This is two and a half minutes of arc across. And remember, 60 arc minutes in a group. So this is one 24 million of the total sky. Absolutely tiny. And they imaged this over, I think it was 10 days, and added up the image images. And you can see in the complete image about 3,000 objects, and virtually all of them are galaxies. And you can see them here, mostly in this image, you're seeing galaxies, spiral galaxies. So they are like our own galaxy with, with millions of stars in them. So this you know, impresses on us the size of the universe. It is totally staggering. And then going back to the question, we are either alone in this vast, vast universe, or probably, if we're not alone, then probably this universe is teeming with life. And we don't know which is the answer. Now, it's actually a slightly asymmetrical question. Let me explain why. If the answer is yes, then as soon as we find the first example of extraterrestrial life, wherever it is, then the question is answered, that we are not alone. But if the answer is truly no, will we ever know that answer? Because at the moment, we see no other life elsewhere. Now, is that because it's genuinely not there, or is it because we haven't looked far enough or in the right direction? So I hope you can see that this is really a strange asymmetrical question. We can, if the answer is yes and we find it, we'll know as soon as we do. But if it's no, we'll actually never be sure that it truly is no. Okay, next slide, please. So the next slide, which I can't yet see, but hopefully you can. Um, this was a list which I compiled some time ago of to show these are the names of writers and philosophers and astronomers. And I'm afraid these are all European uh, uh, writers and astronomers, because that is the context that I'm more familiar with. In fact, I would love to uh, somebody will tell me the name of Sri Lankan writers in the past who have talked of, about the subject of life elsewhere in the universe. So some of these uh, philosophers were from the Greek or Roman times. So, you know, two centuries or more ago. Some are from the Middle Ages, Giordano Bruno, uh, the um, Middle Ages, Kepler and Huygens were uh, well-known astronomers. So this is not a new subject, but what is new about it is that really for the first time in the last what, 50 years, we've actually been able to study scientific and make our first attempt to look for life elsewhere. Next slide, please. So in this context of life elsewhere in the universe, one has to mention the Drake equation, one of the strangest equations in, in physics, I think. So Frank Drake was a radio astronomer uh, who carried out the very first search by radio telescopes looking for radio transmission from other um, civilizations. This he did it around 1960, and in doing that, he wanted to estimate whether it was sensible. W was it possible that there were other 
communicating civilizations. And he came up with this equation, which is next, please. And so N is the number of um, uh, civilizations that can communicate, have the potential to communicate with us. And it's the product, the multiplying together of seven factors, seven numbers. So the first one is the star, the rate of star formation, the second F subscript P, the fraction of stars with planets, and then so on, the fraction of planets that can support life, then the fraction of those that can have intelligent life, and the last parameter there, L, is the length of time that a civilization, intelligent civilization, might exist for. And, of course, most of these factors are enormously uncertain. So when he did the calculation, uh, next please, he came up with essentially any, the value for n could be anything from, well, essentially zero, a very tiny number, to millions. Um, now, we are slightly better off now. For example, we know far more about how many uh, stars might have planets and so on. But still, <laughs> the allowable range for n, the number of uh, communicable uh, intelligent civilizations out there, is just enormous. So uh, next, please, where should we look? Well, I mentioned that um, the search started with radio astronomy, but now, um, next, please. So that I would suggest there are two real strong possibilities now in our own solar system. And I'll say a little bit about those places in our own solar system, because the last 50 years with space research, we have come to understand our own solar system and the different environments so much better. Now, of course, with the solar system, we're not talking of very sophisticated um, intelligent life with arms and legs and so on. But if even if we find just simple simple life somewhere in the solar system that is independent of life on Earth, then that tells us an enormous amount. It tells us probably that life is common in the universe. If it can start twice in our own solar system, then it is likely to be common throughout the universe. And the other possibility, next please, is in the field of exoplanets. I'm sure you're all aware, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, that the last 20 years has seen an explosion in our knowledge of planets orbiting other stars, exoplanets. So for me, it's, it's almost a race between these two, the solar system or exoplanets. Right, with the solar system, here's a schematic, where should we perhaps look? Where is it possible? So I would suggest the following. Uh, next. So this should show, it should highlight with a red square the possible places to look. Venus, I'll tell you why in a minute, you might be surprised. Mars, next. Mars has always been perhaps the most popular location. Uh, next, Jupiter. Well, not Jupiter itself, but some of the moons around Jupiter. And then next, Saturn. And again, it's not Saturn, but it's the moons of Saturn, which show some very interesting environments. Um, okay. So let's look at some of these. Next, please. Venus. Now, why on earth Venus? Uh, surely, I'm sure most of you will know that Venus on superficially seems like the most hellish place in the solar system. Surface temperature is something like 470 degrees centigrade. The surface pressure is 90 bars, 90 times greater than what it is on the surface of the Earth. Now, the Soviet Union sent several spacecraft to the surface of Venus 
and the best of them survived for about two hours. It's so hot and the pressure is so great. It's probably the hardest in the solar system uh, for a spacecraft to survive. However, it's not the surface that interests astrobiologists, but um, the atmosphere, because at about 50 kilometers above the surface, would you believe the temperature and the pressure vary to what they are here on Earth? And this has become of great interest because just last year, next slide please, there was a very, very exciting result from a team, an international team of astronomers led by Jane Greaves there on the right. She's at the University of Cardiff in Wales. And she led a team using radio telescopes. You can see them at the bottom there, one in Hawaii, one in Chile. And they detected and you can see in the schematic next to the telescopes two spectra and they claim that these spectra which came from the atmosphere of venus were of the gas phosphine and phosphine it, you would not expect except perhaps and this is they said only perhaps if there was some sort of biological activity so what had been really the speculation of science fiction writers, namely some sort of simple life high in the atmosphere of Venus, got great support from these observations. Having said that, there have been several scientific interpretations of these results in the last year, which have given different interpretation. But there's now a new focus on Venus, and in the last six months, both NASA and ESA have announced missions to Venus, partly stimulated by this interest in the atmosphere of Venus. Uh, next, please. And now we're moving to Mars, which for, um, well, 150 years, there's been speculation about life on Mars. So there should be, next, there should be an image of one of the from one of the martian rovers nasa as you probably know have a great success with martian rovers they have shown that we do not indeed have vegetation or canals on the surface of mars as had been speculated a hundred plus years ago in fact we know that mars is uh, really in some respects similar to some of the deserts here on Earth, very. What we know for sure is that the atmosphere of Mars is very thin. There is no magnetic field. So the radiation on the surface of Mars is probably too severe for life to have um, to flourish. However, what is interesting is that if you go below the surface, there is evidence that there might be water, there is probably water below the surface, and you are certainly protected there from the harsh radiation environment. There's no fundamental reason why um, there couldn't be very simple life uh, below the surface. And I should say that next year, Europe is launching a rover which for the first time will dr drill below the surface to one meter or more to try to look for life. I should say, though, that we, Europe, we have not yet landed a rover on the surface of Mars. So this is going to be a big challenge. OK, next, let's move to Jupiter. In fact, to the moons, to the Galilean moons. So I hope those will appear soon. So the four Galilean moons discovered by Galileo in 1610, when he used the newly discovered uh, instrument, the telescope, and discovered the four large moons of Jupiter. Why are these interesting? Well, these are interesting objects in their own right, but why might they be places to look for life? Well, in recent years, mostly from spacecraft 
uh, observations, the Gal uh, Galileo spacecraft, for example, we've learned a lot about them. And in particular, we could have, next please, you should see a schematic of these moons of Jupiter. And what is especially important is that we now believe there we are. So Io, the most volcanically active in the solar system, Europa with its strange surface, Ganymede, you could have next please. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system and the only one with a magnetic field. Um, but if you push the next, you should see at the bottom models of the the structure of at least two of those moons, uh, Europa and Ganymede, which show that we are pretty certain that below the surface, uh, and the surfaces are icy for those two moons, we believe that there are global liquid oceans, oceans of water below the surface. And so this throws up the possibility because there are these are large enough to have some, some internal sources of energy, and we have water. Certainly on Europa, we've detected organic molecules. So we have a possible ingredient. Again, another environment in our solar system where um, there we are. I can now see at the bottom, I hope you can see, um, yeah, there's the magnetic field around Ganymede at um, I saw for a minute a schematic which showed the, the structures that we believe exist with oceans below the surface of these bodies. Uh, um, then let's go on to next, Saturn. And especially, uh, yeah, I now see the probable oceans below the surface. So Saturn, and in fact, we're going to look at Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, and the only moon in the whole solar system with an atmosphere. It has a thick atmosphere of nitrogen. Well, there's the whole Saturnian system. Very complex, fascinating place, and the place we sent Cassini Huygens to. But it's Titan and Enceladus, two of the moons I want to mention. So, next slide, and that should show. The image we got when our Huygens probe landed on the surface of Titan in 2005, we saw what looks like a dried up lake, uh, lake bed. In fact, and the next slide, that was from Huygens, but Cassini, the orbiting spacecraft with its radar, flew past Titan about 140 times. And with its radar, it could penetrate through the smog and it saw it saw lakes, even small seas. And here you can see a 400 kilometer long river feeding uh, into one of the lakes. Now, the liquid on Titan is not water, it's much too cold, but liquid methane. And uh, it seems that methane uh, performs the role that water does on, on Earth. Next slide, please. And uh, just have a look at the image on the right. This is our model of Titan. And again, we believe pretty strongly that below the organic rich atmosphere and surface, there is a global subsurface of uh, water and ammonia. And you look at the bottom bullet on the left, the current models suggest that this ocean is 50 kilometers below the surface and is maybe as thick as 250 kilometers. So again, this is another place where simple life could actually exist quite uh, comfortably. Next slide, please. The other place in the Saturnian system, this was a very big surprise, an image from the flyby of Enceladus. And we see water spurting through cracks in the surface out into space. 
and this water was laced with organic molecules. So again, another place, a small place, Enceladus is only a few hundred kilometers in size, but it possesses the ingredients that one might need for simple life. So the point here is that we have several places, perhaps many places in our solar system where life, admittedly in a very simple form, that life could indeed exist. So now let's move on to the other side of the equation, if you like, um, to ex exoplanets. I'm sure you know that an exoplanet is a planet outside our solar system. And I do have to show this picture, I'm afraid. This is the co-discoverer of the very first exoplanet. This fellow is called Alex Volschan, and he's from Poland. And he was working in uh, Puerto Rico uh, using the American radio telescope. And he and his colleague found the very first uh, extrasolar planet, actually around a pulsar, not around a star. And Alex Volstein is actually my cousin. So this is one of the reasons I like to show his, his picture. I'm very proud of his discovery of the first extrasolar planet. Um, next one, please. OK, so those that uh, the field of exoplanet research has taken off and you can see this is, these are the number of discoveries by year since the first discoveries. In fact, um, I, I checked and the, the current number of confirmed exoplanets is around four and a half thousand in total, with perhaps two thousand other possibilities. So what we now know is that exoplanets are actually probably extremely common. In fact, perhaps almost every star has a planetary system around it. Uh, next, please. Uh, OK, if you look here, there are written the five different oh, techniques. There are five different techniques for detecting exoplanets. And I'd just like to show on the next slide a simple animation which describes two of them. Um, and this is quite uh, straightforward. So if you could just click on the uh, animation button below the diagram. OK, so this is showing um, a star at the center, so imagine like our sun, and a planet, a small dot going around it. Can you play it again? Oh, yeah, there we are. So imagine if we are on the uh, observing, we're say at the top of the image, as that planet blocks out a little bit of light, from the star, we would see a tiny in the light, tiny, tiny, tiny dip. So that's the transit method. But also look at the uh, star at the center. Can you see it is orbiting? It's orbiting about the center of mass of the system. So the other technique is to look at a star and see if we can see it wobbling, you know, moving a tiny amount backwards and forwards. So that's the radial velocity map. And most exoplanets have been found by these two techniques. The next slide, please. Now, why is this? Finding planets we now think is relatively easy, but that doesn't tell us anything about life. But if you look at this schematic, as the planet goes around the star and look at the one on, on the left. At a certain point in its orbit, the light from the star will pass through the atmosphere of the planet. And we can learn a little bit about the planet's atmosphere by looking at the light. And in this next slide, you can see there's real data here on the right by, by looking at this light from the star passing through the planet's atmosphere, 
we, we can get a spectrum of the atmosphere. It's incredibly difficult, but the first um, the results from, from really 10 years ago have shown gases like water, carbon dioxide and methane. And what is going to be very, very exciting is that when the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, is launched, we hope later this year, it will have great capability to study better than any other facility the atmospheres of these planets. And it's by looking at these atmospheres that we might be able to see the signs, the signatures of life. Next, please. So uh, let me, I'm getting to the end now. When will we know the answer to the question? Well, next. It could be tomorrow. If the answer is yes, uh, when I say tomorrow, it could be the end of this year when the James Webb um, sees clear signatures of life in the atmosphere of one of these exoplanets. Or if the answer is no, well, perhaps we will never know because we're always waiting for the ultimate answer. So it's, um, you know, it's the biggest question perhaps in astronomy and astrophysics. And as I say, maybe we'll know the answer next year. Maybe we'll never know. Maybe we'll always be waiting for the answer. So can I go on to, I think, the last slide then? Um, and I like this quote, which I think really applies to almost everything that is done in astronomy and astrophysics. It comes from Steven Weinberg, who was a theoretical physicist. And he, he said, the effort to understand the universe is one of the very few things which lifts human life a little bit, a little above the level of farce. And, and I rather like that. You know, fast means what? Chaos. And I think that the job of science, and I hope that some of you will, in your careers, you will, perhaps some of you will be scientists and you will maybe be involved in some of the international teams who are looking for life elsewhere in the universe. I hope and I, I hope that uh, the, uh, these thoughts have given you some, uh, some uh, uh, fuel for thought and for um, maybe uh, inspiration for your future careers. So thanks for your attention and I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take any questions. We have some uh, questions in the chat. Yes, well, I can see a couple. Yeah, Titan. Is Titan hot or cold? Good question. Titan, in fact, is very cold. It's minus roughly 180 degrees centigrade at the surface. And that's because of its distance from the sun. It's about 10 astronomical units. So sunlight is quite weak. Um, and, and that is why, so the surface is, is icy, water ice, which is frozen, but methane, methane and ethane um, exist as liquids at those temperatures. So that's why this very strange place has seas, or at least lakes, and, sea, and seas, it has the largest lakes are like the Caspian Sea or the Great Lakes in, in Canada. Um, but they're made of liquid methane. And so you could argue that it's too cold for life. But, um, you know, we find increasingly on the Earth that life can exist in the most extreme condition. So I wouldn't say just because it's so uh, cold that life is, is impossible. A simple life, we find this... Um, you know, in, in nuclear power plants, in the hottest deserts on Earth, in, in some very cold places, in the most acidic or alkaline environments. So, um, you know, life in a simple form is, is very tough. Um, I 
I can see a question saying, is my cousin still alive? Yes, Alex Volskan is, I think, three years older than me, and he's a professor. And in fact, he's working on exoplanets in Penn State University in the USA. So he is um, uh, still working hard. There's a, qu a question about extremo files. So, um, yes, extremo files, that's an expression that is used to describe these, you know, simple life forms which have been found on Earth in these what we would call extreme conditions. Very hot, very cold, high level level of radiation, high level of acidity or alkalinity, and the term extremophiles is, is used. And it, this really shows that certainly in my, during my scientific career, we've realized that life can exist in a much, much wider range of, of environmental conditions than we ever thought. Now, we, of course, as as developed human beings, we can't live in those conditions. But that doesn't mean that other life couldn't. There's a cause we're not necessarily looking for life quite as we know it. Um, I can see, is Venus a lightning storm planet? And that's an interesting question. Um, yes, lightning has been detected on Venus. And in fact, Lightning is thought to be possibly very important because it provides energy which can stimulate chemistry, um, chemistry and biology. So it's thought that, for example, on the early Earth, one of the um, ingredients which produced the conditions from which simple chemistry led to complex chemistry, then biology, was lightning. Which, which provides energy and uh, in, into, these, um, into these reactions. There's a question, are, are you working in, in NASA? Well, um, I, I, so to work at NASA, I'm pretty sure you need to be an American citizen. Um, so I worked in the European program, um, and we often collaborate with NASA. And uh, I would hope that, and science, I must say, science now is so international. And I don't know um, the exact situation in Sri Lanka, but I'm sure that in the future, your science agencies will work with many other countries. And so, um, it, it is, you know, and in my work in the UK, I've worked with people from all over the world. Uh, so, so one of the great things about it is that it is so international in nature. And when I started, when I was a youngster, I thought, oh, the only way to do space research was if in Russia or America. Uh, and of course, that has, that has changed great deal. Um, are there any planets just like Earth? Well, that's, that's a very good question. As I said, we know for certain four and a half thousand other planets outside uh, the, our solar system. And we're now, most of them don't look like Earth, they're much bigger. But now, as the techniques get better and better, they are finding that first of all, what they call super Earths. So that's planets like the Earth, but a bit bigger. But now there are a few that we think are possibly like Earth, at least in terms of their size and composition. But, but the field of exoplanets is one which will really is developing enormously. And in your lifetimes, so I hope in my lifetime we'll see, I think, more and more planets which might be a bit like the Earth. Okay, I see questions about the multiverse. 
that's beyond and white holes and wormholes you need to get a cosmologist to talk about how many solar systems in the universe my goodness well i think we're now seeing that solar systems are common so you could even say you know almost every star that we see in the sky probably has planets around it um so even if only 10 percent of them have planets remember there are 10 to the power 11 a hundred thousand million stars in our milky way galaxy so even if only 10 percent have solar system that is an enormous amount so has the earth received any sign from any intelligence species outside the solar system the answer is no um, if we had, then we then the question would have been answered, and we could say yes, there is intelligent life. But no, we have seen and heard nothing. Some people say that means that there is nothing or nobody else out there. But I think it's still very, very early days. You know, the universe is so large. Uh, there's mention of the wow signal. So these are some strange radio signals which have been detected. I'm not an expert in that, but I think there is most likely a natural explanation for those signals. The thing is, every t if we every time we find something strange, we shouldn't immediately assume that it's because of a UFO or uh, you know, we have to get very, very strong evidence before we can say that there are other uh, civilizations. I see somebody says, can they invade humans, I think. Um, that's, that's interesting. There are some people who say we shouldn't be looking for life elsewhere because perhaps they might not be benevolence they might have bad intentions towards us and they might be evil aliens that's a good point the thing is the distances are so vast that even if we make contact by radio it would take them to travel here it would take them probably thousands of years but it's a very good point as a question about in future will venus have water in it um well that's that's a good point what is the future of venus don't know at the moment it's much much too hot on the surface though as i say high in the atmosphere is where water exists thinking of the future titan might be interesting you know in a long long time the earth will expand it will boil the oceans on the earth but it means that not a solar system places like titan they will warm so maybe in the future titan will be the place to live on um, but i wouldn't worry because we're talking about millions and millions of years in the, when the sun um, expands heats up uh, the earth's ocean Right. <clears throat> so we are moving into the last five minutes of today's session. So uh, we can answer Have one. We found all the planets in our solar system, somebody says. That's, that's interesting. Yes. I think that the main theme is that no, there are no other planets. So there are still some people who believe that there could be very small planets further out of the solar system but of course we now um, what is a planet and what's a, a dwarf planet so pluto when i was at school we learned that pluto was a planet but now we don't call it a planet. we now know there are probably thousands of objects which are dwarf planets smaller objects uh, at the edge of our solar system um, Planet, that's planet nine. Yes, some people call that planet now nine. Um, it's 
So there are a lot of questions, some of which I don't quite understand. But uh, I, I do hope, well, let me just say that, that um, I think the opportunities for science and technology are, are tremendous. And, and I hope that many of you will have the opportunity to, uh, to have a career in some form or another, even if you don't. I hope that you will follow um, the research in astronomy and astrophysics because it belongs to us all. I, like most of my colleagues, I'm conscious that when we do our work, that we, we teach in, in universities, but the research is paid for by generally by the people, by the taxpayer, and that the results we try to make accessible to everybody because, you know, the universe belongs to us all. And uh, whether you're a professional scientist or just interested, um, it belongs to us all. And as Steven Weinberg says, the, the study of science is something which which takes us above the level of farce. And, you know, in the world, sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's a little bit depressing, some of the news and with pandemics and so forth. So the study of science not only helps us practically, but also, I think, elevates our mind above our day-to-day -day worries. So oh, I hope some of you have found this interesting. As I say, I've been very honoured to be able to talk to people in Sri Lanka. And uh, I would love to, to visit one day. And I believe that you are quite good at playing cricket. So I would love to see uh, a test match in Sri Lanka. Am I right that cricket is very popular? Yes, it's very popular here. And what about football and soccer? Is that to have a following? Mm, football is played but um, it's not up to that level of cricket as of now. And uh, in the chat, Indeed. various uh, thank you messages for you, sir. So we highly appreciate it. And the messages seem to come. Anyway, uh, we are running out of time. So even yes. if we speak for one hour, there will be questions. But uh, I think you answered many interesting ones. And once again, we thank you uh, for taking your time. And despite all the technological issues, uh, on our side also, we would like to apologize for our attendees if there was any inconvenience. And uh, we should again thank sir for taking the time off even two days prior for getting ready with the stuff and then making a presentation and taking the time off today to speak to us half way across the globe. So uh, thank you very much uh, for inspiring us. Well, th thank you. Thank you for inviting me. As I say, I, uh, it's a great, great pleasure to be able to talk to, to Sri Lanka. I would, as I say, love to visit. So I hope someday maybe to come with my wife and uh, we can visit the college. That would be lovely. Yes, that would be very lovely. And uh, be sure to visit Sri Lanka, have some nice tea and enjoy the stay after everything settles down. So yes. Well, and I wish you all good health and hope everybody's staying safe. I guess every country in the world has had its difficulties and uh, fingers crossed we will all get through this. But it's uh, not easy times. But, uh, yes. I wish you all good health. So good night, everybody. Yes, with that, let's end today's session. And... Uh... Thank you everyone for joining and uh, keep up the enthusiasm. We will meet you with another session soon. And once again, let's thank Mr. John Zanecki and uh, continue being interested and let's meet on another day. So thank you everyone.